conclude this fourth chapter dealing with uh, one of the important facets of uh, the church. You ready? Okay, Ephesians 4. And uh, we want to look at verses 17 to the end of the chapter. Now that shouldn't be too much of a problem for us when we're going to just simply skim over some of the important truths. And thus far in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, we have been looking at the second major aspect of the book of Ephesians, and that is the spiritual needs of the church. And the spiritual needs of the church we have found to be threefold in light of the last part, and that is the need for the worthy walk, the need for the wonderful walk that you find in the fifth chapter, and then the needs with reference to the wa walk of warfare in the sixth chapter. Now then, the one worthy walk we've observed is a walk from the standpoint of a spiritual standard, the unity of the spirit, and then the spiritual supply with reference to the walk in light of that standard, dealing with the spiritual gifts, and everyone has a gift of some nature. And then you've had the special gifts from verses 11 down through verse 16 with the divine intent of the Lord that the church might <coughs> be built up and conform to the image of His Son. Now then in verses 17 down to the end of the chapter, you find the practical section of sanctification. Sanctification in light of this worthy walk. Now, <clears throat> sanctification has been, been greatly misunderstood, I feel. There are those that hold to the truth that the church is to experience and can experience ultimate sanctification here in this earth below. Now, what, you, what they mean is this that you can get to the place where it's beyond sinning. Now, don't you believe that? Because as long as you've got a sin nature, and as long as I've got a sin nature, we're going to sin. 1 John chapter 1 uh, clearly settles that issue for us. Uh, that um, there isn't such a thing that you and I can attain to perfection here below. However, that standard perfection is still there. God does not change His standard. Therefore, some may argue, well, then uh, if God has set the standard there and you can't arrive at it, well, what's the use of even trying? Well, the use of trying is simply this, that God holds out for us a standard of spiritual conduct to adhere to it, and it will cause us to walk more and more in faith with Him. Now, let me show you with reference to this fourth chapter just a little bit of an outline here that I trust will be of help for us. Now, in verses 17 through 24, you have sanctification with reference to one's spiritual condition. And there's a great contrast here in light of the spiritual condition, that which is uh, true for the unsaved and that which is to be true for the saved. Then in verses 25 to the end of the chapter, you have <coughs> sanctification with reference to some specific aspects that he's going to deal with. All right, now let's look at it in light of sanctification with reference to the spiritual conditions that's outlined here in verses 17 through 24. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to walk all uncleanness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conduct the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now here he speaks of spiritual condition with, re with reference to this worthy walk 
or the walk of the believer in the church, the body of Christ. Now, in verses uh, 17 uh, and 18 and 19, there are three major things that are mentioned here. First of all, <coughs> he says we should not be walking uh, as the other Gentiles walk. Or this is the this is the sole manner of the unsaved conduct because of a condition. And says so in the vanity of their mind, or the purposelessness of their mind. You see, the <coughs> unsaved have a bent of thinking which is not of value when it comes to the matter of the spiritual life. Their bent of thinking is that which relates to the life here, <clears throat> not with reference to the spiritual life. And so they have a mind that's geared to the spiritual condition uh, in which they find themselves. All right, now that is to be foreign to the Christian. Now then I'm told why they have such a mind in verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorances in them because of the blindness of their heart. All right, the second major uh, thing that he talks about concerning their condition is that they are blind. They are not able to comprehend because of the ignorance which they have by virtue of a spirit, uh, by virtue of a depraved thinking. Now, when you're saved, you have a new life. And we have what we, we, re, what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the last verse I believe it is, that we have the mind of Christ. And so when you get saved, you have a new bent of thinking. But when you're not saved, you're not going to be thinking along the lines of spirituality whatsoever. You may long for that and all of this, because man has a dead spirit about him, but he is not able to walk in uh, enlightenment because of the blindness that he has. Now here in verse 19 is rather a pitiful verse. First you have the purposelessness of the mind, then because it is a blind mind, and then in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Now, <clears throat> this is rather an amazing statement. And I have pondered this a number of times. And in fact, I, I, I recall uh, ministering on this a number of years ago down in the Southland. And uh, uh, an illustration which I uh, gathered from uh, work down there. In fact, it was out at <clears throat> the fairgrounds. Notice what it says, who being past feeling, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. What does it mean to be past feeling? Totally insensitive. And I gave a an illustration which is not too good as I just relate or referred to. And that is, I, I hope you won't take offense at this, but they're pickled in sin. That's what they are. Going out to the fairgrounds there in Dallas, uh, there's a, a museum. And in this museum, there's all kinds of displays that are on exhibit. And just as you come up the steps into this museum, I, uh, there's a glass case over here, and they have all kinds of reptiles in there. It's a hideous thing. I just hate snakes anyway. But there was a great big jug like that, just a huge thing. And there was a rattlesnake head. That's all they could get in that thing because that rattlesnake head was so big it couldn't put any rest of his body in there. And that rattlesnake head was in, and his jaws opened like that, you know. Great big old fangs sticking out. And what an illustration. That uh, head is preserved, isn't it? It's preserved in some kind of a pre preserving solution. And that is 
much what we see from a spiritual point of view in light of the unsaved. And that is who being past feeling. They're, they're, they are, they're, they're absolutely uh, preserved, pickled. In sin. Here this summer, <clears throat> when Rick Ladd was up, you remember Rick and Cindy? Well, he's on the police force down there in Racine, and he has seen it. Uh, he, he, a, a guy must have a particular bent of mind to, to serve as a policeman in some of these big cities because, oh, the godlessness they see. And he was telling about he and a Another policeman was trying to arrest the man, and he, they they get on to get on to it when they know exactly if, if they're dealing with a man that is under some kind of dope, because if he's intoxicated with this dope, why uh, he doesn't feel, and uh, you can just beat the tar out of him. He not only doesn't feel, but he, he, uh, his strength doesn't wane. And he just continues on and continues on, and they just about have to kill a guy like that in order to cuff him. And uh, uh, boy, Rick knew right off the bat when uh, he had let him have it as hard as he could. And you know Rick Ladd's a pretty good-sized man. Just as hard as he could hit him, and uh, he didn't even bat an eye. Well, he knew right then and there what he was uh, up against. And, boy, they called for backup and all of this because he and his buddy were also great big husky guys. Why, they were running out of strength. But this character wasn't because he, he was pickled with this dope. And he had untold amount of strength. <coughs> That's what this stuff will do to a guy. Well, listen. We often wonder why in the world the unsaved, the unsaved won't respond. Well, folks, they got a blind mind. Absolutely. And they got a purposeless mind. And then they're insensitive, absolutely insensitive the spiritual truth. And I'll guarantee you it takes a miracle. Miracle to reach a mind like that. You and I can't do it. If the Spirit of God doesn't reach in behind that uh, situation and bring that person to a new life in Christ, listen, you and I, I don't care how many times we, we get, uh, drag some kind of a confession out of them or get them to do this and get them to do that because of some bait, they're not going to be saved. Well, here's a condition, and he's bringing this to the fore with reference to the sanctification of the believer in the church to walk the worthy walk. Now, that kind of a life, that kind of a life is in contrast to now what he's going to talk about in verse 20 down through verse 24. But ye, but ye, in great contrast, instead of the vanity of the mind and the blindness of the mind and absolutely being pickled in sin, but ye have not so learned Christ. That is, if so be you've, you've heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Now He lays down the platform. For a believer, that kind of a life is to be foreign. That kind of a condition is an alien condition for a believer or a person in the body of Christ, in the church. And there's a person that's going to change that, and that is Jesus Christ, and He's the only one that can. Then He said, all right, now then, if you've heard of Him, and you've been taught from Him and by Him, now then, you and I have got a responsibility, and that's to be found in verse 22. And that responsibility is this, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. What does it mean to put on and put off? I recall when Lyle and I were in college years ago, and 
Uh, our mode of transportation was this air-conditioned jeep. It was wide open. And we were coming across the hot uh, uh, desert of uh, Utah there, that Salt Lake Desert, and I want to tell you, it can get hot. And so I, uh, she was reading uh, the word to me as we were driving along, and uh, we'd come to this place in Ephesians. Well, what does it mean to put on and put off, put on? put off. And it's a, it is a tense that shows your responsibility and my responsibility. That we're to do this. Isn't that right? We're to, we're to put on and put off. Well, the only thing that I could think of being put on and put off is just like a coat. You can either put it on or you can put it off. Isn't that right? You can put on a coat or you can take the thing off. Well, what does it really boil down to? Since I can't put on a spiritual life and since I can't put off another life, it simply means this, that I must cultivate this. Cultivate it. You know, there are some people who are involved in Christianity, and you can get caught up in this if, if you just don't watch yourself. And that is the super pious uh, people. Now, there is a... There is a um, uh, a, a, a segment of truth but so, well since I can't since I can't create the new life and that's true you and I can't only the Lord can then then it must be God's work to put this on well in a sense that's true but you and I are to cooperate you and I are to make a choice you, you made a choice this morning, didn't you? You made a choice to get up out of the bed and get, get, to, get to Sunday school. Some of you forgot to turn your clocks back, so you got here in Sunday school instead. <laughs> uh, we were wondering if we would have a number of people out for, the, for breaking their bread, but we didn't. <laughs> so uh, uh, you, you made a choice, isn't that right? Absolutely, you made a choice. All right, you and I can make choices to cooperate. You and I can make a choice to cooperate with reference to the spiritual life, or you and I can make a choice to cooperate with the other life. And he says this, that you put on the new man which after God is created what? In righteousness, and not holiness, but true holiness. True holiness. That isn't false. That isn't pious. That isn't hypocritical. That isn't place.